to everybody. I want to say it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to the first of our conference series. And I know that we've got a great mix of people joining, a lot have joined in, and I'm sure more will come in as I'm speaking just now to introduce. So today it's Windrush Day, and I know a couple of my colleagues are in the office, so if they were to turn on their microphones, you'd begin to hear the evening of music, poetry and dance, which has also started in the town hall. And if you were there, if we were all there, we'd also meet Raymond Antrobus, who's going to be joining us on the 6th of July. So I want to come back to our conference here. It's a series of three events, and all of those events will be focusing on how the power of governors can influence the continuous change that ensures equality for all. Throughout this series, we will be aiming to explore how social class and race impacts on the educational experiences of our young people. We'll be putting a spotlight on these three things. What is it that blocks our children from deprived backgrounds accessing the advantages of their peers? What common issues lead to our young people becoming marginalised in the education system? And thirdly, we'll explore what system changes will make the biggest difference to address inequalities. So with this session and with the two subsequent ones to come, we very much want you to ask questions in the Q&A and for others to upvote where you agree with what another comment or question is that someone has asked. We will be recording the sessions so that we can share them with our wider community and certainly follow up and sort of capture from that what are the key learnings that come out of this. So let me set the scene for today. And I just want to begin by, by telling those of you who don't know my own story, that I am the child of immigrants. And from telling you that, I think you might understand where my passion about this conference and about ensuring equality for all comes from. My father sought refuge here when he was unable to return to his homeland of Latvia after the Second World War. And my mother sought a better life than the one that she would have been called as a contadina, which is a girl of low social status working the land of Italy. So for me, growing up in England and achieving success at school wasn't easy. There's no other way to put it. My identity and that of my family was dismissed, as was my right to a good education. In Hackney, it's a wonderfully established and diverse community, and we absolutely do believe that every child has the right to a good education. We also recognise that growing up and achieving success is really tough for many of our children. They face enduring challenges that come from those overlapping aspects of their identity and lived experiences. And sadly, these are the children that we often see at our exclusion panels, missing education, and we and society are absolutely missing out on their talents. With this thought, I want to introduce you to Hashi Mohammed, our key speaker, a successful barrister, author of People Like Us. I can't tell you how delighted we are to have Hashi back. He did speak to us in 2018 and he was incredibly inspiring. And at that time was sharing what was yet to be published, the book called People Like Us. <clears throat> Hashi, I know you'll be sharing your personal history and heartfelt views. You'll be explaining why your story of success is far from typical, and you'll certainly be provoking and challenging us to influence the system changes that you absolutely have witnessed can drive better equality for all. So with that, I'm coming off camera and Hashi's coming on. Welcome, Hashi. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, Maggie. Uh, the only correction I'd say is I'm a barrister. Whether I'm successful or not, that's, uh, that's for other people to judge. But uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't do this with you all in person, but I'm sure there will be another opportunity to meet in person. And as Maggie was just saying, the last time I came to speak to you on a Saturday morning when Harry and Meghan were getting married on that very same day, a very sunny Saturday. Uh, it was a real pleasure to have shared what was then only nascent ideas about what would become my book. And it has since obviously been something that many of you listening to this have uh, uh, read and, and I very much look forward to discussing those details with you. Today, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about my own life story and journey. I want to touch upon a couple of the passages in the book to kind of highlight uh, uh, the points and the ideas that are in the book that many of you already know about. 
I also touch upon what it means to be successful. How do we define success these days? Uh, what is the debate like in this country about social mobility? Race and class is a big part of that picture and how these systems then impact things uh, on, a, on a bigger scale and what that looks like. So to start with where I, where I am now, I, I live in Brent. Uh, um, I've, I know Hackney very well. Um, but very much many of the similar issues that, that faces inner city London boroughs is quite common between us. But I was born in Kenya to Somali parents. Uh, both my parents were not formally educated. My father came from Somalia to Kenya as a driver of long distance trucks. And my mother, who never learned to how to read and write as a child, uh, had given birth to 12 children. Now, imagine that long list of kids. Uh, I calculated that my mother was pregnant pretty much for nine years of her life uh, uh, in total. I'm number eight in that list. Uh, in a way, I'm glad, obviously, that she didn't stop after number seven. But I wish she did after number eight because it just got out of hand after after that. But in the early 1990s, a series of events came together that led to a situation that, that meant that our family had to leave Kenya and seek asylum wherever we could find it. And those series of events is what has led me to being where I am today, working as a barrister and having worked on this issue. And crucially, now me talking about what it means to be successful and sharing with you all what my life trajectory has been like. And those series of events are related to the fact that there was the collapse of the Somali state in 1991-92. And in 1993, everyone essentially left Somalia and Kenya to seek asylum wherever they could find it. Some of my siblings ended up in Canada. Some of my siblings ended up in America. I, uh, along with some of my siblings, ended up in the United Kingdom without our mum. And just before that, as if uh, life could not get more complicated, in addition to the collapse of the Somali state, in addition to many of those problems happening that meant that there was a huge displacement of people, there was also the death of my father in a car crash in Kenya. And so you can imagine in a very short period of time in 1993, we went from being a wholesome family that wasn't stateless or without roots to becoming displaced refugees mourning and without parents. And finding yourself in Britain in the early uh, 1990s without your parents, having helped to just bury your father, not speaking a word of English, not understanding the culture, not understanding the system, not understanding what is going on, who you are, why you're supposed to be doing certain things, what your rights and responsibilities are, no parent to try and guide you. The oldest person we had was my sister who was in her very early 20s with her own two children and to try and settle. Now, I want to just, and I, at that time I was nine years old. That's a really important detail as a nine-year-old to try and uh, re-establish your whole life in that context isn't exactly going to be easy. Now, I want to read you a small passage in my book about and this will be relevant to many of you as, as teachers and governors and people who are in, involved in, in pedagogy and educational systems in Hackney, just how important the first four years of your life are. So how critical are the first four years, bearing in mind that I was, a, I was only nine when I arrived, but those first four years can make such a big difference in setting the trajectory and setting the, the, the tone of one's life. So this is a passage from the book that I thought was worth sharing with you all to kind of give you a context of, of how I have been grappling with this issue. And it was really interesting for me to be discussing this and, and thinking about it and digesting it and processing it and seeing what it looks like. No period of your life is as important as your first four years. It's when the basic structure of your brain is formed shaping your capacities for language, reasoning, and for interacting with others and with your environment. 
Your early years set the course for the rest of your life, a course that is extremely hard to correct later on. And deprivation begins in the womb. Children born into poverty are more likely to be born prematurely and are more likely to have low birth weight and receive less nutrition in the womb, all factors associated with poorer future health. They're also at a higher risk of infant mortality. They're more likely too to have mothers who suffer from postnatal depression and stress during pregnancy, something that can affect the way in which their genes are later expressed. As babies and young children, they often live in inadequate housing and are part of families that struggle to afford enough food and heating, stressful situations that rewire their brains to make them anxious and jumpy. And poverty is not just about material deprivation, although that is a part of it. It, means not, it, it. it also means not just the food you eat and the clothes that you wear, but also the words that you hear and how many of them. A US study showed that by the age of four, a child from a professional family will hear 45 million words, a working class child 26 million words, and a child on welfare only 13 million words, a gap of 30 million words. And the reason why that's important is because, of course, when you are all thinking about what are those common factors that block people's success and opportunity, these are the factors that you have to keep in mind, that by the time these children come to your doors, in so many respects, many of them will already be behind and many of them will already be struggling. So you're already having to deal with so much of their time having been set back through no fault of the, that child's uh, 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 set of circumstances and through no fault of anything that you guys have done by the time that you have reached that point. And my educational experience in Brent was really a mixed bag because I was a, a good student in the sense that I was quite talented and focused and always wanted to succeed. But that never really came through because I was also a child who was mourning a child who was tra traumatized, a, tri a child who was a refugee without his parents, a child who just helped to bury his father, a child who was lashing out in ways that I did not understand, in ways I was just telling others that I remember in year seven being suspended seven or eight times just in that first year for really petty fights and small problems. But that really when I look back deep down came from that background and that home of real instability and pain and sorrow and sadness and things that I hadn't processed that meant that I wasn't really focused enough. I did enough to get to GCSEs, enough to do enough A-levels to get to my undergraduate degree uh, at the University of Hertfordshire. I got a very good undergraduate degree uh, 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 together with a first uh, in French when I went on to study in France as part of my undergraduate degree. I then got a full scholarship to go to Oxford for my postgraduate degrees, got a full scholarship to train as a barrister, and then uh, uh, following which I became a barrister 10 years ago, and I've written this book to kind of talk about that journey. So that's the truncated version of where I've come from. And it's really important that um, I don't use my story as a sort of saying, oh, well, if I've done it, so can you. If, if I have succeeded, anyone can do it. But that's just not true. Things are much, much more complicated than that. And, and there's a whole chapter in the book about race and class. And in that chapter, I do talk about, and it's quite sort of serendipitous that today is, is we're celebrating Windrush Day because in that chapter I sort of gallop through 100 years of migration history in this country and I talk about how much when I arrived in 1993 I am the beneficiary of the huge amount of work that was undertaken by so many who came before me as refugees whether it's those who were fleeing Nazi Germany after the war, whether it was those who came to Britain after partition, whether it was those who came following the establishment of Bangladesh, uh, uh, splitting up East and West Pakistan, whether it was the migrants who were kicked out of, 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 of Uganda, whether it was 
you know, what then happened in the 70s and the 80s, and then the early 90s, seeing so many uh, 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 Somali refugees arriving in Britain, we are all essentially standing on the plinth of so much work that was done. And of course, the Windrush generation being in the middle of all of that. So for me, it's really important that one doesn't overstate what, you know, individual success as being the panacea and the example of it being the way forward, because I'm extremely lucky as well as somebody who has worked extremely hard and has harnessed my own talents in a way that I hope will make a difference to many people. I talk about in the book about a story of a teacher who uh, took upon herself one summer to take a few of us to be in queue and buy paint. And she wanted us to paint our form class. And we spent two weeks uh, cleaning and preparing our, our, our form class. And subsequent to which we painted the room uh, blue and white with the walls being blue and the ceiling being white. And that summer was a real kind of special moment for me because we were living in such a precarious situation. We'd only been in Britain for about three, four years. And this, we'd been, we'd been moving around from one squalor council accommodation to the next. We had been in really unstable situations. And this was the first time a teacher took it upon herself to spend her summer telling us, come and paint your form class and spend some time owning this room. And I, to this day, remember that moment as being a real moment when I first understood what it means to be in Britain, to have some sort of roots, to have some sort of purpose. Because when September came around and we were back at school, I looked at, I remember thinking, this is the only room that I spend time in that actually I've had a say in. Because at home, I was sharing my bedroom with five, six different people at any given time, relatives, of course. But I never had any privacy. I never had any sort of room to myself ever growing up. My son, who's 18 months, has a bigger room than mine at home today and he will never share with somebody and and I just think about how far that has brought us and in 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 that summer for me it was such a really special moment because I then later discovered as I was writing in the book I talk about it in sort of idyllic fashion and how amazing that summer was and it's so funny because I got in touch with the teacher 20 years later who's now living in Canada and I sent her the chapter of me writing the the story of painting the room blue and how wonderful that summer was and she said well actually i'm have uh, i'm afraid i have to tell you that 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 your recollection of that summer isn't exactly the same as mine because you guys caused one hell of a mess i got in trouble with the with the with the caretaker you ended up putting paint in places that it shouldn't have been you blocked the the drains and i mean you know all sorts of funny things that she told me about it that that i then ended up actually using in the book as well but it's funny how the brain plays these tricks on you when you're a child in those moments when you experience something really different and profound and special and meaningful, you look back on it in a way that you've re really rewritten history in a positive way or a negative way, depending on how, how you've seen it. And the final thing I'll tell you about that is that I also discovered since then, not at the time, that the teacher who did that for us her parents had come to Britain fleeing the Holocaust. And so she grew up being told of the stories of refugees. And she said, when I saw you guys, and I saw you guys arriving, it immediately brought to me the stories of what my parents were telling me they were experiencing. I was seeing you guys experience. And this was my way of sort of honoring what they went through, through you guys. And for me, that, that is an example of a way in which a teacher has taken upon herself to do something different, something that isn't in the syllabus, something that isn't going to be marked through the uh, 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 off call or AQA or whatever the exam board system or, or whether Ofsted is gonna find a box to tick on that. This, this is a really special, specific, unique and individual uh, step taken by, by someone who made a huge difference to me. And so, 
when I think about those special moments, that is something that has made a big difference to my life. And, and that is something that I always look back at. So moving on to thinking about what, what it means to be a more social, uh, socially mobile society, for me, I think the education system, and this is really important, I think for me, the education system is scapegoated by politicians and governments as a place where the answers to social mobility must be found. If we think about any time a politician or a government policy person talks about what we can do about making a difference in social uh, mobility in the society, they almost always come back to education. Whether it's Tony Blair's education, 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 or the mad conversations that the Tories have about grammar schools, they all come back to education as being the panacea. Well, the reality is that I'm afraid, and we have to be honest about this and confront this, education is not the answer to social mobility. Education gets us to the starting line of a race. Education is absolutely critical to any human being's progress. Education is what makes you understand language and reasoning and deduction and arithmetics and basic literacy, numeracy, and or oracy of being able to communicate things. Education allows you to be able to be a functioning member of society. But the notion that because you are more educated and because you have more degrees and because you have more uh, uh, letters after your name, it necessarily follows that you will become more socially mobile. I'm afraid the evidence isn't there. And so for me, the education system and the pressure that it's put under to find the answer on social mobility issues is I'm afraid a weight that it cannot bear. And I don't want to tell a child that they shouldn't work hard and focus on their education if they want to focus on a good future. That's not what I'm saying. But we need to be realistic about what education can do and the limits of education, because there is so much more that's outside of your control that also equally has an impact. That is about social and cultural capital that you, those kids are passed down to. That is about the kind of home environment those children are growing up in, whether that home environment matches the, 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 the educational uh, environment that they are, they are functioning in, whether that kid is one who is not having to bear huge amount of responsibility very early in order to either work or look after an elderly person in their family or a sick individual or their younger siblings and so on and so forth. These are the factors beyond education that determine the difference between those who make it in quote unquote and those who do not. And we need to be honest about that. And we need to be honest about how we can deal with that. We can be honest about to what extent can we address that within the education system and the, to what extent we can't address that in, within the education system and how we then do that. The other aspect that I think is quite important is also about race and class. Race and class, for me, in a perverse sort of way, is two sides of one coin. Because if you do talk about race in this country, it's an important issue, and it's an important issue on its own. If you're a young black boy today, growing up in Hackney or in Brent, you are not, this is not blanket, but you are predominantly going to be faced with particular hardships that are particularly specific to you as a young black boy growing up in inner city London, if you're going to state schools, growing up in deprived communities. If you're a young black boy who is Muslim, who has a Muslim name like Hashi Mohammed, you can already see the disadvantage that you face starting out as a black boy has a next layer on top of that, where your disadvantage is further compounded by the discrimination that you face based on your name and your faith. It is also true that growing up where we were growing up, completely on state benefits, from one squalor council accommodation to the next, where no one in my family worked, where we were refugees, 
where we didn't understand what it meant to be poor, where we did not eat good quality food, and where one could even struggle to be called working class because I always joke that I don't remember anybody working in my household, so I'm not sure we can qualify as working class. You then have another layer that's on top of that disadvantage. And this is the concept that is often referred to as intersectionality. And so for me, it's important that when we are talking about race as being a really important issue that's affecting disproportionately people in this country, and in particular in the kind of councils and local authorities that we are talking about here, it's really important that we don't lose sight of the number of other compounding features that also deal with issues in a way that then further complicates and further disadvantages people in a way that is phenomenally difficult to untangle. And so for me, we have to start thinking about this creatively. It is not enough anymore for you to be a good teacher. It is not enough for you as a head teacher to set a good standard in the school and then be done with it. That's already hard enough, I appreciate. It is not enough anymore to say that in order for us to help young people fulfill their potential, we just got to make sure they go through this exam system and exam machine and everything's going to be fine. We have to do much more. We have to do much more outside of the classroom. We have to do much more within the classroom. And we have to do much more in understanding the particular circumstances of every particular child and every specific concern and every specific issue that faces each of the children who walk through your classrooms. Because if you fail to really grapple with these very complicated issues on an individual basis rather than a one-size-fits-all catch-all way, then what happens is that far too many kids fall through the cracks. Far too many will be lost for another generation and far too many talents will never be fully realized. And so I think I could be talking a lot more and I could be uh, uh, addressing many more things, but I want to finish on two, two aspects. The, the other thing I really want to talk about is the concept of luck and success. Luck as defined by a, a really good professor called uh, uh, Robert Frank, at Cornell University talks about luck being as though you're, if you're cycling, imagine you're cycling on a bike and you are going up a hill. You're going up that hill and you can feel each and every single one of your muscles straining. You feel the wind pushing you back. You feel the strain on your body and you feel that need to really push up that hill. That is bad luck. You're aware of it. It's in your face. You feel it. It's clear. But the moment you take a left or a right and you're going down a hill and the wind is in your back and the physics are in your favor, that is good luck. But what's fascinating about the way the brain works is that you are much less likely to associate and attach good luck to external factors, the physics of the situation, the wind in your back. And you're much more likely to then say, this is all me who's pedaling and going down this hill. No one's helping me. And so for me, one of the things I'm really keen on understanding, and I want people to understand more, is the role of luck in your life. I am extremely lucky in many ways that I could count, and I talk about it in the book. But when it's bad luck, we are very clear that it's the hill. It's the wind that's pushing me back. My bike's got a flat. It doesn't quite do well on hills. We are ready to point to external factors. But when the physics is in our favor and the wind is behind us and the bike is moving as fast as we would like it to, we tend to shy away from acknowledging what those, what the, those factors of luck include. And what that means ultimately is that an incomplete and irresponsible story is told to so many young people about what it means to be successful in this country. 
when they look at their social media profiles and they see so many people with their nice cars and nice trainers and all sorts of things, so many children are growing up with a warped idea of what it means to be successful. They ultimately want to be either YouTubers or some sort of online profiler or influencer or something like that. And that's because the narrative and the message that has developed over that time has been predominantly really about you can make money and quick and you really don't have to work that hard. And I'm not suggesting that many of these YouTubers and influencers aren't working hard. They're working exceptionally hard. But the message they send across and the pictures that they paint is often one that is completely wrong and incomplete because they don't want to tell the kids the reality of what faces them. That it is very difficult, that there are multiple steps forward and multiple steps back. So for me, that, that's one of the things that I really would love for you, to hear more about from you guys and how we deal with. So I'm going to stop there now because I've spoken uh, for too long already, I think. Um, and I'm happy to touch upon any of those points or more. I hope I've covered, uh, otherwise I'll get in trouble with Maggie, uh, all the points that she wanted me to cover. But if I haven't, please do not hesitate, uh, Deborah, to pick those up in the Q&A, because um, I don't want to finish this um, without making sure that Maggie's happy. Thank you so much, Hashi. It's such a delight to hear from you. And thank you for such a rousing um, presentation. Uh, where to start? Where to start? There's something that you talked about um, in the presentation, if, if I can go back to. Sure. I'll, 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 try, I'll try and paraphrase it. So you talked about beyond education and the idea of social and cultural capital. And I really want, I guess, our audience to understand that. Can you unpack that for us? A, of course. A little bit? Yeah, sure. So social and cultural capital is, in, in a nutshell, the social capital is the kind of contacts your parents might have, the ability for your parents to ring up somebody to give you an internship, the ability for your parents to secure you the, your first work experience, the kind of social capital that allows you to mix at a very early age with people like you and people who will be growing up like you. That's why I actually called the book People Like Us because one of the things that people do that often is completely baffling to most parents is that I think most parents know, those who pay for private education, they know they're not really paying for the education. Mm -hmm. They know that those kids are not going to sit a different set of exams as the kids that might be in a school in Hackney. What they're really paying for is, of course, the small class sizes and a bit more attention to their kids. But actually, what they're paying for is that social and cultural capital. They want their kids to be mixing with people like them, who talk like them, who frequent the kind of same places as them, who might go on a yacht with a Russian oligarch's kid in the summer. Maybe not so much this summer, but other summers. And that is the social capital that then allows for that child to grow up with a sense of confidence and ability to believe that they are destined for something and a kind of confidence that would allow them to express it verbally and non-verbally. The cultural capital, it goes hand in hand with that, which is the ability to introduce your child to understand what Shostakovich looks like and be able to be culturally au fait with various Shakespearean references, musical references that allow them to be seamlessly mixing with different people from different backgrounds and also be confident enough to express themselves in a way that allows them to be coming across as cultured. And one of us, birds of a feather flock together, you go into a barrister's chambers and you come across somebody who went to your old uh, Oxbridge College, and you say, hello, old chap, is that portrait of so-and-so still in the corridor when you walk past the dining area? Oh, yes, the funniest thing happened when I was there. I nearly fell down and knocked it off. Ha, 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 ha. It's that kind of nonsense that allows a particular class of people to pretend as though they are belonging to a special class and they are mixing with people like them. 
That is what social and cultural capital looks like. Brilliant, understood and so well explained. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I should also add, if you went to a, 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 a school in Wembley High and people are getting stabbed, you're not going to have that kind of great story to tell. And social cultural capital isn't going to be like, oh, gosh, I, I dodged so many knives growing up and I nearly got arrested and harassed by the police. Ha 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 ha. Doesn't quite work. That's not the kind of social and cultural capital that's going to get you far. Right. Understood. Brilliant. And so you've, you've touched quite a bit on, uh, I guess, the, the race and class and the fact that um, you feel that race and class is what shapes our identity. Um, so in terms of modern Britain, what do you mean by that? What does that look like? What does that, that feel like? Race and class and how that shapes identity in modern Britain? Yeah, uh, I think that it, it, modern Britain is at a critical juncture, I believe. And I've never been asked this question before. And I think, forgive me for giving you um, what comes to me instinctively. I really think we are at a almost like a chasm on a massive hill whereby we're having to transition between one kind of mountain to the next but there is a huge hole and gap between and in order for us to be able to transition from that one mountain to the next it's, it requires a huge amount of cooperation between us to be able to build that bridge to get across and for me, three things at the moment are causing us a major headache and no one is able to really fully appreciate just how impactful it is. The first is that we are yet to come to terms with Britain's history in a way that is healthy and in a way that allows for everybody to have a part of it in, in, in what that looks like. And I'll come back to what, what I mean by that. The second is that there is very poor or non-existent leadership that is, able, that is able to articulate what this moment is about, what it feels like, how we should be approaching it, how we should be digesting it, what are the sort of fault lines and the ability to be able to say to people that there is room for everyone here and this is how. And the third is the kind of vision to be able to say, that's where we're headed. Now, I don't know whether we'll get there. I don't know whether that's the right place to go. I don't know what the route is exactly, but that's where I think we should be headed. I could be wrong. We may not get there tomorrow, next year, next month, or even 20 years time, but that's where I think we should be going. No one has been able to articulate that. So taking those three things in stages, the past at the moment is something that is so deeply divide, divisive that I think for me, it's currently a chasm between those who think that Britain has a great past and a great imperial past and anybody who has anything bad to say about it is just mad. And the other is to say, well, Britain has committed all these atrocities and it's an awful place and it, will, it has committed awful things. I just don't understand these debates. It is possible to say that Winston Churchill was an absolutely great wartime leader who did some extraordinary things to push this country through and defeat Nazi Germany at a critical juncture for Europe. But it is also possible to say that he was also a racist drunk. Those two things can sit well together. It's okay to be able to say those two things, that this was an unbelievably great man who came through at a great moment. But he was also an unbelievably flawed human being who had all these flawed characteristics. But I just don't understand why you have to pick one or the other. And that for me is what's so difficult about the current conversation is that you have to either pick one or the other. The second aspect of, of that picture, uh, as I was saying it, it, it just a moment ago, is then articulating currently how we have those conversations without it being so polarizing. And we just can't do it. We've got somebody like Priti Patel who's doing what she's doing and others who, you know, 
it's just not there. No one is, and do I need to mention the absence of our prime minister? And what does the future look like? What does the future look like? What is the future Britain? Can you tell me of anyone who has articulated a, a future of this country outside the European Union, where this country is comfortable with its cultural identity, comfortable with its ability to, 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 to celebrate Armed Forces Day one day and Windrush Day the other and British Asian food the next. I mean, what does that vision look like? What does that Britain look like? What, what does that Britain look like where, where we are all comfortable with one another post, post the Queen and post whatever comes after the Queen? And how do we get there? And that for me is when you ask me about the modern Britain, that those are the sort of three aspects that I struggle with at the moment, because it just feels either really shallow conversations or really polarizing conversations and no vision at all. That's, that's instinctively, and I've never written anything about this before, so I might have said something that has offended somebody here, but that's my instinctive thought really interesting because we've had a question from and I'm just going to read it um, and it might speak to some of what he's been asking here or she's been asking here and it says I'm a seven I'm 71 years old and the quality issues have improved greatly since the 1950s and how do we but how do we speed this up and I guess I don't know if it is an issue of speed is it an issue of reimagining um, I guess what modern Britain needs to look like in you know the area where we push inequalities I don't know but I, I would love for us to speak to that question because it came quite early and I want yeah to no I mean I think if you think I completely agree with the person who's 71 years young not old that we have made a huge amount of progress we have made a huge amount of progress and and I think that that is also something that is missing from this conversation and is often missing from the the discourse is that those who are itching quite rightly for us to make more progress can often be accused of not doing enough to acknowledge how much progress we have made. But equally, it's important that we acknowledge that there is so much more progress to be made. Now, for me, when I think about whatever you might think about, just think about how far we have come that at this precise moment in time, just 20, 25 years ago, people were plastering National Front uh, things on people's shops. And the person who's asked the question may well remember there was a, there, the, 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 there were actual slogans in elections, in Smethwick, in Birmingham, that people were saying, and forgive me for using the word, if you want a N word for, it, it rhymes quite well, if you want a for a neighbor vote labor that was an actual slogan being used by a political party in this country okay that's in living memory today whatever you might think of them putting their politics aside you have the chancellor of the Strecha, who's an indian pretty patel who's the home secretary swella braverman who is the 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 the, the attorney general a man called Sadiq Khan, who's the mayor of, the, of London. If you turn on your radio in the morning on Radio 4, you'll hear a woman called Michelle Hussein. You know, I, I could list you a bunch of these things. Now, putting their politics aside, that is an amazing amount of progress. I absolutely detest these, this Tory government and everything that they stand for. But it is also equally okay to acknowledge that this is amazing that we are where we are. Sajid Javid uh, 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 sitting in, in health, Nadim Zahawi sitting in education. You might think that they're no different to any other white man in their politics or whatever you might say, whatever, I know that people, some people might say that. But for me, that shows us a huge amount of progress. And that excites me because that tells me that Britain is comfortable with people who are of color sitting in the great offices of state, even though they're using those great offices of state to do harm to this society, which is desperately sad. But that for me is a huge amount of progress that we need to be celebrating. And actually what we should be doing is grabbing power from those people to do good, not to be sending people like me to Rwanda. 
I love that, grabbing that power to do good. Time is far. I mean, I could have you all to myself for the rest but of the But do you know what you should do? Just ask me about three questions. Three <laughs> questions in a, in, a, in a quick succession, and I'll answer them as, much, okay. as quickly as I can. Well, I'm going to leave with the last question, then invite, um, I think it's Tao and um, another colleague to come. But one more question I think yes. someone really wants to ask. And it's this, in an ideal world, what three things would you implement to tackle these issues in a 12-month period? Not 12 month know. period 12 month period you can't even have a you can't even have a baby and learn how to mop its chin in 12 months but okay next two i'll take together very quickly and then i'll answer all three of them together did you say tau tau and shakila i'm gonna hand over to them thank you deborah go on tau sitting in the palace of whatever you, wherever you are <laughs> No, um, yeah, so as, as you can see, I'm currently in office of the town hall at the moment. Um, so yeah, I am a young governor. Um, I joined um, this scheme probably for about, yeah, since last year, July now. And um, I am currently a young governor for Mossbourne Park Fire Academy. Um, I've been a member for the past uh, year and um, I can happily share now that they've just asked me to join as full governor from... Um, Congrats. Thank you. So, yeah, so as of September, I'll be joining. I'm currently going through the process and all the formality and the form. So, yeah, I am here to sort of answer any questions. Um, so, yeah, do ask, um, and I'll try my best to answer. Fantastic. Thank you. Shakila? Hi everyone, I'm Shakila Scala. Um, I was part of creating the Associate Young Governors Programme. Um, I'm a chair of trustees for Immediate Theatre and um, whilst I started the programme with the rest of uh, our Associate Governors, I actually became a full school governor back in December. Um, it's been an amazing experience, it's something I've wanted to do for a very long time and actually it's um opened many many doors for me and um I learned to I learned quite a bit in my first few months but obviously adding to the knowledge I already have so yes please feel free to ask any questions um of me and Tao and yeah we'll be happy to answer them so can I ask you guys uh, a question which is that first of all I think the young governor program is fantastic I think getting more young people involved in the process is great. There aren't enough young people involved. We need more people like you guys. But tell me, each of you, if you will, uh, I'm conscious of the time, what is the one thing that you've noticed in the period that you guys have been doing this that has either shocked you, surprised you, or pleasantly sort of given you a different perspective on things? Because I'm always, because you guys would have come to this fresh, right? You wouldn't be golden oldies like me coming into this so I, I wondered what you experienced and what you saw that made you think huh I didn't realize things like this work like that how um well what sort of intrigued me to join this process was you know when I was speaking with Maggie um, um, um Tequila, it, I think I was told there were only 2% in terms of the stats nationwide that were sort of governors that were under the age of 30, as well as being from a minor ethnicity board. Um, and, you know, from seeing all the governing bodies, they were, you know, mainly white, um, you know, more, I would say probably 40, 40 50 year olds. But I mean, they were all very lovely. And I think with all the conversations that we've had now, it's definitely highlighting, you know, the equalities. And, you know, I do want to add that, you know, one of the, the reasons why I wanted to join and become a young governor was that being in care, um, I grew up in foster care in Hackney myself. And I have to say that I've had one of the most sort of positive experience um, compared to a lot of other young people. So, you know, I... I've always been a champion for young people and yeah. I wanted to sort of give that voice and give back. And yeah, so I think what shocked me was very much in terms of the stats um, of the 2% across the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. The country. Thank you. Shkila? Um, For me, uh, it's been about how 
um so certain things I would say people are like oh my god that's amazing or thing but for me it's a no-brainer um yeah. it's how the young perspective um changes a lot of things and I think just recognizing how valuable it is um I myself had known that prior to becoming a governor because I'm a trustee but also for the fact that actually even in the educational sector like just encouraging people to think about things differently yeah. has been a, a game changer like our bo- um our governing board has quite a lot of new governors but actually just encouraging them to look at things possibly from a young person's perspective or actually saying have you thought about how this may come across to young people or how do we include young people in everything we are we are doing to make sure that we are inclusive inclusive as our vision and aim say and we are making sure that we encourage people and tell young people that we care we can't just say we care we need to show them as well so that was the sort of like light bulb moment for me really amazing amazing thank you very much for both of you for 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 those answers and for everything that you're doing I wish you guys uh, a great deal of success to answer the question about three things that w- we could implement in tw- in quickly to try and I don't think you could implement them in 12 months but the three things that I would love to do very very quickly is first of all to go back to a time when some of you may or may not remember, we had the, what's what was called the short start program. If you remember the small passage that I read from the book, for me, the investment in the first four years of children's lives is absolutely critical. And if we can go back to a place where we do a huge amount locally to do something for as many young people as we possibly can in the first four years of their lives, that would be the most amazing thing. Second thing, At the moment, I work in planning law and I do a lot of work around planning and environment issues and housing. For me, overnight, if we were able to allow local authorities to start building affordable housing, that won't happen in 12 months. But if you were to give them the power to do that, have the resources to do that and get on with it, that for me would be a game changer in terms of where we are as a society. The third thing I would say is give opportunities and ways of getting more young people from Hackney to be able to go somewhere outside of Hackney every summer, all expenses paid. That for me would be a major game changer because a lot of these young kids would never leave their boroughs until they're much older, where they usually will have had their horizons way too narrow and will not have experienced enough things early enough. So for me, the the housing issue is a big issue. Early years is a massive issue. And I would say experiences for young people outside of their immediate purview are the three things that I would think are huge, huge game changers. I've got, I think, time for maybe one more, or do you want to take over Maggie and close, or how do you guys want to proceed? Not quite, Hashi, because on the screen here, Thierry's there. The camera's not working, but Thierry's come. And Thierry, can you hear us there and unmute? So Thierry's from... Another scheme in Hackney from Young Futures Commission, of which um, Shakila was part of as well. Chair, I don't know if you can hear us and if you're able to unmute, because I know your camera was a problem. If you unmute soon. There you go. Yeah, I can, I can, yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi Thierry. We don't see you. Just go okay, away. Talk. <laughs> yeah, hi. My name's Thierry. I think I might be the youngest one here. I'm 18. I, I do work with Young Futures Commission when we look at how to change things in Hackney for young people. Yep. Um, I'm also an elected leader for Hackney Youth Parliament. So uh, my manifesto is to help with children in mental health and education. Yep. And my other partner in that is policing and better relationship with young people in the police. Yep. So I've joined Young Futures and I want to be a young governor to help with um, foreign parents that don't speak English in primary and secondary schools. Because that's an issue I think people Very are important. overlooking. And it's, yeah. And I did talk about it briefly during the anti-racism conference. And my little story was um, that I remember the parents couldn't speak English and complain because their children were forced to have vegetarian because they didn't cater for halal food. And because they couldn't speak English and no one was going to help them, they couldn't get through to the school about that. And I think it, because in hindsight, I look back over it it because it was in primary school, but now I believe that's a big issue and I would like to tackle that stuff. So yeah, amazing, amazing. Congratulations and thank you for that. Thank you. Tia, I don't know if there's a question you'd like to pose to Hashi, challenge him in some way. Any question. 
Um, <laughs> one question I did have when you was talking about that summer experience when you was painting, how do you think you can equip that in a modern society for students that are suffering with misbehavior in school? How do you think we can integrate that? Well, that's a very good question. I think for me, that experience of that summer, I don't know whether the health and safety rules and the various red tape that exists in schools these days would even allow for something like that to happen. But for me, teachers who have the capacity, the time, the energy and the resources, because not every teacher's not every teacher will have that time. Time is a luxury and resources are a luxury. Try and do something slightly outside of the box to make a difference in the, in the lives of young people. Because that teacher was doing it over the summer. It was all through her own volition. She wasn't getting paid. She was spending time and money on us. And she was spending her summer holidays with us for nothing. And the misbehavior point is a really important one because as I said earlier, I got suspended seven or eight times in year seven. And that was because I was a troubled kid who had gone through trauma, death and difficulty for a long time. And so for me, I needed somebody to be able to see through all of that and help me. Today, unfortunately, nobody has the wherewithal the energy the patience to be able to help you with anything like that they're much more likely to reach for the exclusion uh, 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 weapon or find a reason to kick you out of the school because you might be poor for the statistics of the of the building and we have to do better than that so to integrate it it has to come from the leadership of the school it may also come from the governors it may come from the young people instituting it but the the, the, the stay within the lines processing and the traditional ways of seeing things in educational system isn't tenable when you're dealing with a highly complex society with a highly complicated problems is what I would say to that. Mm. Hashi- I think I, that's all, that's all I've, I've stopped Maggie. Yes, yes, that was brilliant. There was one more question, but I'm going to leave it at that because I think that's a really sort of resonates with all of the audience in what you just said. And, and Annie's going to jump in. So I think, there we go, switching around. Annie's going to close the conference for tonight. Thanks, Annie. Thank you very much. It's been um, very inspiring from all our speakers. So a huge thank you from me. Um, I, I want to finish off by asking the governors who are listening um, some things I think about, and I want you to think about. Um, Hashi and Maggie both talked about um, their starts in lives, and that that was a challenge, and there were difficulties. But if you look at their journeys, you can see that they had huge potential that has been fulfilled in many ways. And I, I want to ask governors whether you think that belief in the potential of every single child, every child is embedded in your school? And is that transparent and visible across your school? Is the language used about children that that every child has great potential? And that I, I think across our schools in Hackney, there are really high standards, um, which we're very proud of and want to maintain. But we know that not every child reaches those high standards. And I want to ask you about whether you think every child of your school sees every child as being on the same journey, but some need a helping hand along the way. If I go back to Hashi's metaphor of cycling up a hill, is there someone there to put a hand on the back and give them a, a push at the time when they most need it? Because sometimes all of us need support at a point through that journey. And is that part of the ethos of your school to make sure that at times of difficulty, there is that helping hand? Um, and I also want to come back to, I think, the sense of real belonging that the teacher Hashi's talked about engendered in him and his classmates, a really strong sense of belonging, which came from something that that teacher understood about the children um, that they needed. And I was thinking about um, Tao and Shakila um, and Thierry, who will be a governor, I know, um, I think we can tell that they understand the children, many of 
children in the school. And while we can't all be like the children and have the same background, I just want to ask about how many of the governors in your school really understand the children and how many staff do. And it's not that we have to have the same upbringing, but making sure that we educate ourselves about what it's like to have that upbringing and that background. Um, I think, again, I think we have there are many strengths and I think our governor sessions are one of them. But I would ask you to reflect on those things. We are absolutely committed as Hackney Education Council to taking forward um, inclusion and diversity. We have the secondary head teachers conference next Friday, the 1st of July. Um, so I'm sure your secondary heads are coming to that during secondary schools, primary heads. We have the anti-racism conference part two coming up in October. I very much hope that you will be able to attend and use the sessions. Um, so we're on, a, we're on a good journey together. We need to make that journey and I mean to help each other along the way. So thank you very much, Maggie. I'm gonna hand back to you. Thank you. I'm going to completely close now by saying a, a huge thank you to Hashi and to all of the other people who participated in the conversation this evening. To everybody who joined us, we will be sharing the recording at probably at the end of the whole series. So, so be in no doubt we'll invite you again to next week's episode, which will take us further into policies with, with more key speakers, more guests. And we really do hope you take away the thoughts and thinking of this inspirational session tonight. Have a lovely evening and um, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.